So welcome everybody. Today is room number 16. We started last year, April 2020, due to worldwide pandemic. Now it's almost over a year. I'm sure so many people are suffering emotional distress and physical pain. And I just hope our gathering help all of you and all of you, we give a nice uh, smile, <laughs> kind message to everybody to create healing energy to everybody. Gail, yeah, could you go to the next slide? We are happy to introduce David Sensei. He met Masanaga Sensei at Yokai, Tokyo, Japan. Let's put the both hands together and let's unite our hands and heart, mind and focus. Namu shinyo ichi nyo to 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 ki mi ho to ke o nenji tate matsuru zangi zange ro konzai sho metsu jo bon no metsu jo gon sho om saraba tata gata hanama and let's reflect ourselves how in yang energy is imbalanced what can we do how we can make a change even small changes may affect other people Let's pray and let's learn how to balance our Indian energy. So today's presenter is David Sensei. I believe he was the last student of Masnaga Sensei, Shizuto Masnaga Sensei. I am so grateful to invite him to our gathering to learn from him. He's gonna give us a direct message from Masnaga Sensei and Suzuki Sensei. He has developed great techniques. As you know, Shiatsu is forever studies we learn forever, ever, ever. There's no moment to satisfy, satisfy ourselves. It's all learning process. Our teachers, master teachers, like David Sensei, will guide us. Let's learn from him today. Thank you, David Sensei. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Kumiko. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, Yoshi Nakano, or Nakano Yoshi, for referring me to Kumiko. And thank you all for joining in to make this group. So um, my background is in macrobiotics. I began my interest in uh, natural healing with macrobiotics in Sydney, Australia, which is where I grew up in 1974. And um, soon after studying or studying macrobiotics, I felt so much better. It had so many major transformations for me. I decided that I wanted to make a future out of macrobiotics. And uh, I, 
lived in, I, I practiced in Sydney uh, for about uh, just over three and a half years, something like that, and left Australia with the intention of going to Boston, which was the macrobiotic center at that time. So that was, I left Australia February 2nd, 1978. And the people that I was uh, studying with in Sydney, uh, American couple, uh, Daniel Weber and Marcia Weber, uh, recommended that I also go to a yoga center in Japan run by Oki Sensei, OKI, Oki Sensei. So I began my overseas trip going to Boston via Japan. And the idea was to spend two months in Japan and then move on to Boston. And uh, after spending a few days in Japan, two months was definitely not on the cards. That's, this was gonna be a longer trip in Japan. So I went straight down to Oki's uh, dojo and it was definitely a great experience. And if you're interested in hara strengthening, Oki yoga is the style of yoga to practice, but it wasn't for me. So I then went to Kyoto for a couple of months, then came up to Tokyo to the Macrobiotic Center. And there, were, there was a class being offered in Zen Shiatsu with Masanaga that had been organized by two Europeans, um, Eric Stocks from Belgium and Thomas Nellison from the Netherlands. So I decided to go along and see. Now, when I left Australia, the plan was to make a living from macrobiotics. That's all. I had no idea what to expect. I knew I didn't want to run a restaurant and I knew I didn't want to run a natural food store. I was interested in the knowledge that I gained through macrobiotics as well as the actual physical practice change, but it was the also consciousness change. So, when I came to Masanaga's center, uh, this really, really seemed like it might be the right thing because um, he was, he had studied macrobiotics and his approach to shiatsu was very much in harmony with uh, macrobiotic philosophy, uh, including his approach to healing, which from my understanding was Recommend recommendations uh, beyond balancing energy of recommending natural foods, recommending natural, uh, recommending self-reflection, these kinds of approaches to the healing approach. So I started classes with him. And at that, at that time, there was just one class a week for Westerners. There may have been one or two classes for the Japanese, but it wasn't enough. And I was really, really keen to learn. Uh, so basically what I did was I just went over to the center and sort of whatever opportunity there was, especially after a few months, I waited a few months before I uh, asked if I could uh, sit in the clinic and watch how they worked. And they agreed to that. So I spent a lot of time just observing the practitioners. I had a lot of shiatsu treatments and I had private classes with one particular uh, teacher uh, or practitioner. And um, so at that time, that was July, 1978. And I was able to study with Masanaga for about, um, about uh, 18 months. And it was really the beginning of him becoming well-known overseas. While I was there, He's, he did three trips. He did two trips to the United States, one to San Francisco, one for uh, an expo, and then another trip, a longer one, at least a month uh, in France. So um, just to give you some idea about uh, Masanaga and his center, I understand he's still, uh, the center is still there. It was in an area of Tokyo called Shitamachi. It was on the uh, periphery or perimeter of Shitamachi, which is called uh, Old Tokyo, which was quite appropriate for a practice which was so traditional. And uh, the actual place, Iokai, the three, there are three words. E means medicine, uh, O means great, 
and Kymene's organization. Someone translated it as the Royal College of Medicine. And in some ways it was uh, in terms of um, his teaching, um, his ideas and what he was like as a person. But the actual college was very small. That you uh, it was on the second floor, you went upstairs, there was an entrance area. On the right was a small restroom and wash, uh, washing machine area. You went straight ahead and all treatments were done in one room. There were eight mats. So there were 16 people in that one room. The mats were small, not like over here. Mats were maybe maximum 30 inches wide and not so thick. And each one had um, an, an electronic blanket actually, floor was carpeted. But you would have situations where this receiver on mat number one, if we want to call it near the door, may have said something or responded to somebody on uh, a practitioner on uh, mat four or five over there, right? Because it was it had a nice close feeling between all the people. So from the practitioner's room, if you came out and turned left, there was the teaching room. So the teaching room was a door with longer, but it was narrower. And it was lined with crates of natural foods. There were like crates of uh, shoyu, soy sauce, and crates of umeboshi plums, and also Masanaga's drawings. So here's an example of one of his drawings. And they were all very colorful. So they were on the walls. If you look at, when we look at the photograph of Masanaga, you'll see something like this behind. And then if you came out of that room and came back into the entrance and turned left, there was a narrow area for uh, a, a waiting room and also selling of these natural foods. And then behind that waiting room, there was an area for the staff to, to eat and leave their things. So that was the Iokai Shiatsu Center. Masanaga was, um, how, like first impressions of him, he was a very warm person. He was very cheerful, very jovial. Um, uh, he had a calmness about him, um, an, an empathetic person. He had a spiritual quality uh, to him. Um, uh, he was very bright and he was very quick. He really buzzed around. He was very moved around quickly. In one class, at the end of the class, we would all get a neck adjustment and there may be eight students. Classes were small, generally speaking, but he would just sort of next person down the, down, the, down the line of students. So that uh, he also uh, participated in uh, things that had to be done. For example, his um, uh, meridian charts, there were orders coming in from all over. He would also participate in rolling them up and preparing them for postage. Uh, he was also a person who had what I would call beginner's mind. Um, I remember one class quite um, amusingly. For some reason, I couldn't speak Japanese, so I, I don't know why. It was a very large class. Uh, normally, there would be maybe 10 students in the class, maximum. This day, there were 25. I counted them, I remember, because there were so many. And he brought the TV into the room. And one of his peers, a man called Noguchi, who taught a kind of exercise. The word for exercise in Japanese is uh, taiso. So his uh, approach was called Noguchi Taiso. Right? Noguchi, Noguchi Sensei. I did his class. I sent it, I said, I, I took some classes with him. And I must say they were maybe the most joyous classes that I experienced while I was in Japan. He had a large group, usually maybe 40 students on a Sunday morning. And it was all exercises in total relaxation. He was very popular apparently with actors. So he was on the TV and he was demonstrating his, his exercises. So Masanaga Sensei got right in front of the TV, completely forgot about all of us, right? And he started to copy what Noguchi was doing on the TV. It was kind of funny. So he really had that sort of beginner's mind that he wanted to learn from, from Noguchi and he really put himself into it totally. 
Um, so uh, I'm just trying to think of some more things like that about him. Uh, the way that he dressed, uh, teacher, uh, practitioners and him, everybody dressed in white. So practitioners might have say karate pants, karate gi, but he would have, he had white pants. He, he always wore a lab coat and um, Japanese people have a soft kind of, it's not a sock, it's like a very soft shoe, like a sock. He would wear those in, in, the, uh, in his uh, center. And um, I'm sorry, <laughs> train of thought getting a little older here. Uh, and I remember one class, uh, traditionally Japanese people would, um, would wear a cover around their abdomen. And the common word is haramaki. And uh, another word was called fundoshi. So a haramaki is like a cylinder that you just put on you, from your legs and you wrap up and it goes to your pubic bone and then up here just to keep this area warm. But there's another one called a fundoshi. And a fundoshi is like a piece of cloth that you just wrap around your abdomen. And I remember one day in class, he was started pulling this material out from his, from his pants. I didn't know about fundoshi in those days, but his fundoshi had become uh, unraveled and he was removing it. His approach in class was unusual for its informality. Normally a class with the uh, Japanese teachers would begin and end with, uh, with bowing, with a sitting in Japanese style called seiza. And uh, in, not in his case, he would come into the room and it was almost like he barely said hello, he just started verbalizing whatever he was thinking about. So I, it was kind of interesting in that way. But there was a very good rapport uh, between um, students and, and him. And uh, so in December of 1979, that's about 18 months after I had first met him, he came back from one of his trips and he wasn't well and uh, discovered that he had cancer, colon cancer. And he continued to teach until the spring. So around about March of 1980. And then he went home and to my knowledge, he never came back again. He went home to heal. And uh, I went and visited him once at his home. He lived about an hour outside of Tokyo. And you know the Meridian exercises. I had to imagine, I could imagine some of them were like standing postures. Maybe he was practicing them on the train going back to his home because uh, it was his nature in a way, it seemed. But um, I had lunch with him and it was in his tea room, apparently. His hobby was tea ceremony and his wife uh, served us Soba noodles, I remember, and he encouraged me to slurp, right? Not like the Western style, have to make it, want to make a sound, that's fine. And she didn't participate. She stayed in the room, but she wasn't part of our conversation. So just to give you some idea, he was very traditional in that way. And as far as his shiatsu, he didn't do full treatments. What happened was you had eight practitioners working and it used it was pretty busy usually. There was uh, people coming through all the time. And then if he was uh, teaching in the other room, then the practitioner, when they'd finished, would go come into the teaching room and ask him to come back to the, uh, the practice room. And he would spend 10 minutes, about 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes with each person, make a diagnosis, and then he would do a few minutes of shiatsu according to his diagnosis. And then on the form, which each person had, he would make all the only comments that were made were excess and deficiency or kyo and jitsu. Now, so and so jitsu, so and so kyo. That's it. Um, so uh, I think those are the main things. Maybe if you have any further questions, uh, in that regard, uh, I'll explain at the end. Now, as far as um, what I've been doing 
uh, one of the problems of studying in Japan at that time was actually being able to work and to study. So what I would do is I would go to the clinic in the daytime and at nighttime I would teach English, which was very popular with Western students at that time. So I didn't get in a lot of practice until the last year and I had a regular customer in Japan. I saw her every Wednesday. So after about a year of just that and uh, it all started to sort of seem right and it was time to go. So I left and came to the United States in the summer of 1982, July of 1982, and basically began immediately uh, to get busy. And that wasn't the plan. After four years in Tokyo, I need a break, right? But that's not what happened. So uh, I started doing treatments almost immediately and not long after I started teaching in Boston at a, at a, at a macrobiotic center. And um, I was very keen on sharing my shiatsu experience or knowledge from a practical point of view. I, I didn't have time to learn theory. And these kinds of diagrams, there are many of them, uh, I didn't have, I couldn't really follow him because I, I couldn't speak English. When we started the classes in English, his English was not very good, but by the end, he was really quite fluent. Um, so I had to wait until I went to Boston to learn the theory. And I spent about, uh, I spent to Boston about seven years. And in that time, uh, I had through Michio Kushi, who was the uh, uh, leader of his institute, the Kushi Institute, had arranged for uh, people to write books on macrobiotics. So my book was a macrobiotic, it was called, the working title was A Macrobiotic Approach to Zen Shiatsu. And then they changed the title to The Macrobiotic Way. And in a way, it is a way, a dough. And later, because macrobiotics was not so popular, they for the second printing, and if you were ever interested in buying a copy, second printing is better than the first in terms of its quality. It was called The Natural Way of Zen Shiatsu. So for me, writing that book, the most important chapter was the first chapter and the second and third parts of that chapter, especially. The approach for me, what I was fascinated, I'm fascinated by Japan. I still am today. Oh, okay. So this is my book, thank you. Uh, as you can see, there's an Italian version of the book as well. And um, I was I'm most fascinated by Japanese culture. And uh, what was fascinating about uh, Zen Shiatsu is that it is a two hand approach, but the two hands have different functions. You have, just as in this diagram here, he talked about this. This was uh, two hands manipulation in terms of yin and yang. And uh, he would say um, that the supporting hand, let's wait for there, just hold it on that photograph there. Uh, no, uh, wait there, that's fine. All right. He would say that the supporting hand was more important than the moving hand. But what was significant about his approach to shiatsu was that it was stationary pressure on the body. The overall idea was vertical stationary pressure. And within that context, you had a supporting hand which didn't move, and you had a hand that moved from point to point to point. So the overall pressure was stationary, one hand not moving, but one hand moving from point to point. And the important point that he would make about the stationary hand was that if you took that away, it would feel much more uncomfortable for the receiver. There's a short, the supporting hand really made it more, uh, made it easier for the receiver to receive the pressure. And you could actually apply, apply a deeper pressure uh, in this way. So um, that's the idea. There was vertical pressure and it was stationary. And when I 
thought of that in terms of Western massage, uh, we had basically speaking a horizontal massage over the body. Western massage goes this way over the body. And not only that, it's not connecting with key. The vertical pressure is a way of intersecting and connecting with the key flow. But Western massage, horizontal, just moves over the periphery of the body, working with the physical body, but it doesn't connect with key. So you can connect these ideas or these shiatsu, these, uh, these approaches to body work with the mindset. And the mindset of uh, Far Eastern peoples, Chinese and Japanese, but specifically Japanese, is clearly vertical. And the two most uh, common examples that we can give to compare, uh, the first is in, um, in the way we address each other. So in the West, when we address each other, we extend our hands horizontally and we move them up and down. There's a movement this way in the greetings. Whereas in Japan, the greeting is always vertical. And as I understand it, the, ver the greeting is always also according to one's status. So when Japanese people greet each other for the first time, they exchange business cards. And this will give them some idea of their status within the culture. You can correct me, Kimiko. I'm open to corrections, right? That's correct. That's correct. But the idea is that one person would bow a little bit lower than the other. There's always superior, imperial, inferior in the culture. Okay? So, uh, of course, in the West, uh, as I explained. Now, the other thing that was interesting also. I maintain, and if you read my book, chapter one, which was the chapter I enjoyed so much writing because of this understand, or this way of looking at the cultures, um, was that, uh, uh, sorry, it's, it'll escape me. I'll, it'll come back, I'll come back to it. Um, yes, the vertical, the vertical, I called it a vertical axis. Japan is a vertical axis culture. Western culture is a horizontal axis culture. And in the, um, in the sense of vertical, vertical axis, it carries the influence of heaven. And heaven is primary. So the primary axis, which is the positive axis, uh, is the vertical axis. So what you will see in Japanese culture, in public anyway, agreement, generally speaking, much more often agreement with people, not this way so much, right? Horizontal is negative, right? right. So right. Our Western culture tends to carry more negative approach too. Um, so there was that aspect. And the, the other aspect that was really, really interesting in terms of popular things is like when uh, I'm writing a book right now and I'm thinking about I'm using this idea for shiatsu on a bigger scale. The most important thing in terms of um, uh, uh, memory of, of Far Eastern culture, going back to childhood, the first image that was, oh, Chinese people are so different, right? Was that the last page of a book was their first page. Right? So if you're going into a Japanese store to buy a Japanese book, the cover is going to be the last page, right? So there's, then later I learned that the writing is vertical. Our writing is horizontal, right? So they write not only down the page in different characters, but they also write backwards this way. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, energetically, if we look at energy in spirals, this is like a counterclockwise spiral. Western cultures, clockwise. Now, how about when they address a letter? So in, I believe in China, but definitely in Japan, you always begin with the country first. So if somebody is addressing a letter here to Kumiko, firstly, USA. Mm -hmm. Secondly, New York City, right? Thirdly, the address and the street would come first, then the number, right? Then would come Kumiko's family name, then Kumiko. 
Kaliko is the, at the end of a spiral leading down to a point. And the point in terms of the culture in meditation is the one point in the lower abdomen. So in Eastern approach of meditation, idea is body mind drops off, right? You come down to a point. In the Western way of addressing, the person is at the top, right? The individual is at the top, and then the country comes last. So the, there is a difference straight away. Right, so how does this all uh, connect with uh, the shiatsu? So I'd like to, if you have any quick questions at this point about what I've said, or should we wait? Can we go to the end? I'm going to, I want to switch now to practice. Yeah, we can ask. Do you have any questions? Everybody's okay? Yes, seems like it. Yeah, no it's okay, mentioned. David. We can continue. Very interesting. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. so we, we shift to uh, practice now? Yes. Okay. So may I ask, um, uh, for me, mm -hmm. can I ask you to volunteer now? Yes. Okay. So if you like face down, I'm going to move this down a little bit more, yeah. just a little bit. Okay. And if you like face down here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And now he's going to direct you. He wants you to focus on his arm yeah. and how he twists it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, I'll explain what we do. Okay. So now the way that Masanaga practiced Shiatsu was basically, firstly, the natural way of applying pressure is more like crawling, right? So, and also I wanted to say about Masanaga, about in his body, he was, um, he was very natural in his body. Uh, he was uh, very relaxed and uh, fluid. And um, anyway, when it came to Shiatsu, the way that he taught was, and I'm going to exaggerate the movement, just so you know, like both hands would be on the body, then you would move into vertical pressure. Apply pressure, come back, move the hand off the body, pressure. Back, pressure, like this. And I've honestly speaking done thousands and thousands of treatments. Uh, I've made most of my living from doing treatments, not from teaching. So after a while, there were some problems with that. Uh, approach. One problem was that everybody has different clothing when they come in for a treatment. And some materials are easy to work on, but some materials are difficult to work on. And uh, that was a, one of the factors. But the main thing that really fascinated me with this vertical and horizontal axis model that I was working on was that if shiatsu is vertical pressure, then the best shiatsu would come from maximizing vertical. So instead of moving into vertical this way, we actually begin in vertical. So once you put a cloth on the body, this is very easy to work on. This is a very smooth, easy surface for you. So it's also cleaner. Like sometimes people, sometimes would be sweaty or People would have um, uh, strong perfume, some women or whatever would have a strong perfume. This is all you're carrying this in your hands. But once you put a cloth on, there's something there that was uh, over, overcame that. But what the cloth actually did was it gave me a smooth surface to work on. So once the surface was smooth, then I could easily move on the body from point to point without taking my hands off the body. In other words, when I'm working this way and I come back, I lose my position. And then I come back in, back, right? Like that. So instead of doing that, if we start with the towel or with the cloth on the body, pressure, slide, pressure, slide, Pressure, slide, 
pressure, like so. Pressure, 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 pressure. So when I'm, the pressure is here, you can see it, my pressure is vertical straight over here, okay? And just in the way that we are crawling here, right? Or here, okay? The pressure in the knee is opposite. So for example, if we're applying pressure here, you're moving from here. Masanaga would call the, he would call the, the hara in tension and the hips koshi behavior. So you put this, what you're feeling into behavior through your hips this way. So all movements are coming from here like this, right? Okay? So from here, for example, um, we start, this is vertical, right? Then at this point here, my pressure is here and here. It's in this knee. Then from here, pressure moves to this knee. This is relaxed now. Okay? Pressure. This is vertical. Pressure. Vertical. Like so. Okay? Pressure. This is on the left side of the spine, down the blood meridian. Pressure. 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 Right? I always begin a treatment with heart pressure, begin, uh, firstly, and then the receive, you get a sense of the receiver's body. You get a sense of what is the appropriate amount of pressure for them. So it's like getting to know you, Shiatsu. And then I often use heel of palm pressure through here, just this. If you want stronger pressure, I always close the fingers. Don't leave them like this, close them. Just like if you're wearing a mitten in the winter, your, your fingers stay warmer than if you're wearing a glove, right? This disperses your key, this integrates your key this way. And also, uh, let's see, um, another point about this. Yes, if you want stronger, start with palm, Heel, right? Stronger pressure, like this. And if you want even stronger pressure, sharper pressure, close the fingers. It's quite interesting. Just a little thing like that will create a totally different kind of pressure. Maybe you need to bring the camera in a little bit closer for that. And I use elbow pressure a lot. And uh, the, again, the main thing is to be supported. Okay. And with same, same technique, left, right. So like this. Okay. Vertical this way, vertical this way. Over, come over here. You can also, if you're working high, you can hold on this side. Here. Like so. Like so. How's that pressure for you? It feels good. Okay. So what you maybe want to show here is just that here, somehow I'm trying to bring the camera down so you see the knees, right? Left, left knee, right elbow, up now. Left hand, right knee. Right elbow, left knee. That's it. The other really good part about working this way is that your body is getting good exercise. If when you're doing this way, sorry, I'm, you know, when you're doing this way, there's a danger of your work becoming static, your own body work becoming. 
your own body uh, movement becoming steady. But the other way, this way, you're integrating your entire body in the treatment. Or here. This one bone, bladder area, kidney area, side. I use knees for this part usually. Just for breath for demonstration. Right, this is supporting me. Get comfortable there. Okay. Like so, and come up like so. Right. I'm going easy because I don't know if it's excess or deficiency. Like so. okay. Same technique here. Usually, I like to use pushing for support. Same technique. This, like so. Pressure. Pressure. So the calf muscle. So just hold. Right? Actually, this is going a little off. I wanted to show you a little pressure there. Like this. Here, the support is this way. Again, right elbow, left knee, pressure. Okay. So, can I ask you? To lie on your left side. Yeah. Try and. Yes, yep, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you lift your head up? So pull the neck, hold it in your hand, like so. Pressure. Pressure. These two. These two. This and this together. Pressure. Pressure. So again, pressure is not coming from here, right? Pressure comes from the whole body. This is cool, man. So many people, this area, you included. Yeah. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. But the thing is, okay. Um, last night I used to talk about, oh, you know, I didn't mention in the diagrams, um, he used to talk about treat, kill first, treat the deficiency first, but there's a problem with that. You have to, to make change, you have to let the body know that there's a problem, but the way that you do it is by always applying both hands to the body, the both hands, then you have even if it's uncomfortable, uh, there's support for it and the body will receive it. In other words, what I'm saying is, let's suppose in your mind is, in this case, gallbladder is excessive. Maybe it's down here, you can feel. I, might, I like to work close to the body, so. 
Pressure, right? Pressure, right to left. Mm -hmm. Like so, right? This needs a little bit more stronger pressure. So even though it's even though it's excess, by using heel of palm, well supported, it's tolerable, but it wakes up. And then you will apply the pressure on the deficient channel. And in that way, you can relieve this tension up here. So even though you're not working it directly, like 95% of the time, at least, if there's that problem is there, it will su substantially lessen as a result of the shiatsu, the way that I work. These are all, there's no, a lot of people with kidney deficiency, but not, not in um, Pauline's case. So just to show you the technique here, for a triple heater, right? Bring the body over, all the way over, as much as you possibly can. You want this vertical. So you're not working from back here. All the way over, pressure. 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 Sorry. <clears throat> pressure. 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 From here to here, pressure, pressure, pressure. From here to here, and you're positioning your body only so that it's going to be for you to make the crystal in the car. Yeah, and apply pressure like this. Yeah, like this way. Mm -hmm. From here, this way. Support, large intestine channel, left, right, right, left. You see that? Yes. yes. We're doing bladder support on the bladder channel here, here to here, here to here. And so, right, so I like to open the fingers up here, two points actually on the channel. This one here is supporting. Particularly good technique if it's deficient channel. Okay. I find uh, this area is a really good area. I like to work a lot in the side position. I think uh, you've got really good access to the channels and it's easy to work. Because a lot of people, they're, they're so inflexible when you're working with the mind face up and their legs don't go down and it's hard to get good, uh, a good, um, uh, what's the word? A good, um, uh, it'll come to me in a moment. Um, anyway, good angle to work on. This is liver, right? So come forward. Vertical. So this one here is working here. Pressure is here to here. So normally this wouldn't happen where she's resisting when I'm working on somebody. I'd be a little bit more uh, careful. Okay. Heart governor. Come from this side here. So this is the angle that you want back here, this way. Okay.
pressure gives pressure. Pressure. Yeah. Small intestine working from here. <clears throat> work from here. Okay. These two, these two. Okay. And even further, further down, spleen. Need to be careful in this area here, spleen channel, a lot of stagnation with many people. Even here, you can bring your whole body into it. More. Okay. Right. Let's just try once more here. This way, right? Again, this way. Even further over, I should be over more. I'm looking for the efficient channel. Young and strong, it's you. <laughs> I'll find the uh, Efficiency. I have a problem with my blood level in the community watch. Yes? What kind of problem? I we'll try we'll try with the blend here. So after I ate like some spicy and fatty foods, I noticed like a pungent sensation. Oh yeah. Okay. And so I went and they did a scan on my organs and they saw I had like some like microstones in the blood. Yes. Blood. So it wasn't anything big, but it was enough to make me hurt. Right, but you want to be careful with the diet in the future, otherwise the stones get bigger and cause more trouble. Yeah. Anyway, for me, this is how I would work deficiency holding or cure working holding like this. Holding. So you I'm just like, for example, a little, this is the only one I can really feel maybe some deficiency. So usually after this, when I come back, you feel more relaxed relaxation in your neck. You know, we didn't do a proper sleep and use you know, diagnosis, but I think it's a bit easy to actually look at it as little not. Honestly, it felt much better. Yeah. Like as long as you stay working on the legs and notice a difference. So that's sort of what the idea in Masanaga's approach is that um, instead of coupling this excess into submission, 
you, I, the way, firstly, I should say, firstly, is that the body needs to know that there's a problem. So begin with some kind of pressure that's well supported over the excess mind, but don't force it, but make the body aware of it. That wakes the energy up. Then you go to the deficient channel and drain that energy away, and then you come back and it should be much better. That's the way it works. Can you lie face up? So working on the legs, same technique, this time over the abdomen or over the hara. The problem for me with the hara, using the word hara, is that even if, now I've been familiar with the term for these years, it's only through doing um, regular breathing meditations, Zazen, and really understand a little bit about what hara is. So, you know, I use the term abdomen more because I think to the Japanese it has a different meaning. But it has a lot to do, I think, also with spontaneous response. Um, as I said about Masanagi, it was very quick, it just like responding quickly. In, uh, and I notice that in other Japanese people that I know, which I think is coming from the center, it's not coming from here. This, so anyway. anyway, so support here, and then this is just a general pressure, right? General pressure. So you should be able to see in the body from here, it's just coming this way, okay? Pressure, this is this angle through here. So this angle is this way. I don't agree with the approach of working here and here. I don't think that really works. It's better to come down <clears throat> and just work the area separately like this. The other idea is, I, you know, ideally it's better, but I don't know that it's practical. And you can do the different stretches through here. Right? Or, uh, oh, sorry, triple heater. Same. Okay. Etc. Knees, I don't, in my book, uh, if you get my book, uh, the techniques that are in that book are very similar to what I learned in Japan. But just through practice over years, there are different things that you tend to um, don't work for you and I have different approaches. Um, if you're using the knee, I once did like this, in front of Masanaga, and he didn't like that. <laughs> you, always use from here. Right? If you only use this technique, you have to support on the other end this way. Kidney, kidney uh, support. I don't use the this lung channel during hardly ever. It doesn't really work for me. Um, but most other channels, like I use the small intestine channel in the interior a lot. I use the spleen in the arm, the muscle of the spleen channel. This is blood. This one, uh, the, these inner, it depends. On the right leg, it's more difficult. And the other problem is, can you let it go? The other problem is most people are not as flexible as you are, right? The legs up here somewhere, you know, so that's why it's better to work. Um, I find better to work in the side position. But if you're doing this from this way, same technique, support, pressure, 
pressure, pressure. Spleen channel is easy to use. Topo, like this. Okay. Small intestine, stretch. Small intestine, I usually use thumb. Follow? Yeah, follow? No, no. Like that. Heart governor. Through here. A little bit higher still. Now bring your posture around this way. Okay. Support. And from here, little. This is tight. This one here, right? <laughs> Jitsu. Jitsu. Okay, so you're in your neck, your gallbladder is too tight, mm -hmm. and it's partner the liver is also too tight. So liver, liver gallbladder jitsu. Okay. So uh, usually after doing this is not fair at all, but the way that I would work the whole leg. Usually, like nearly every time when I come back to show them, and I also like to show the receiver um, uh, what's, what the change is, that they can feel it. If they can't feel it, well, I'm not doing my job, I'm going to try and figure something out. You know, it's wrong. So, but in this case, usually, nearly always, this will be much more relaxed. So the right leg, left leg, are different. So I think we're running short of time. I'm just going to do the left leg and then we'll stop and then see if you have any questions. I this is not how Mas Mas and I used to do both legs from the one side. Right? I truly work from here. Like this. I don't like doing it that way. I want vertical pressure. So I will come over here this way. Come back to here. Okay. This way. Pressure is in uh, these two, and from here, general pressure, general pressure, general pressure. If you want, you can use heel palm, heel palm, heel palm, stomach channel, okay? Lower, support above, below. Okay. General palm pressure. Getting to know you, she asked. Okay. Feel the palm. Okay. Cool blood. Same. I think this is, um, in Masanaga's case, Japanese people tend to be more flexible than Western people. Things are changing now because young Western people and you uh, become much more aware of diet, eating more plant-based diet, so your body will become more flexible. Large intestine, you can use this way, like so. Same technique for kidney. Or but, uh, for a bladder, I work this way. As you can see, I use fingertips a lot in the way that I work. Oh, that goes. Okay. Okay. Small uh, spleen. Stretch. A little more. Stretch. Elbow. 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 
Hill, me, small intestine. On this leg, I'll use Lobo, 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 more, high covenant. Follow the line. Line's going out this way, like so. Move around here. As much as you can from over the point of pressure. And bring the toes to the knee. Stretch back this way. Liver. 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 Like so. Is it possible that you can have jitsu on one side and Q on the other side? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, different, definitely differences. Yeah. Yeah. And after you've done, made, try to make change, come back. All right, so that I think is what I want to show you. I'm happy to show you more, but I'd like to turn it over now to you in the audience and see if you have any questions. Yes, David, there are some questions. Okay, then um, will you excuse me if I sit there closer? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Judy. There's a question so from Emily. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Sarah. I'm curious, can you expand on the more subtle, subtle aspects uh -huh. of setsu shin during assessment and while balancing kyo and jitsu? according to Masunaga? I don't know about from uh, Masunaga, the more uh, subtle aspects. One thing I'd like to say about diagnosis classes with him was that I did many classes. He, the way that he organized his classes was in a series of eights. He had three levels. So you would go through a series and then come back and start again. And uh, in the diagnosis classes, I never, never experienced one class where a student got it right. right? Never. So uh, it was um, something that I found, uh, I had to try and figure something out for myself. Uh, but the way that I work with the cloth, I think this gives you a much uh, more, for want of a better word, intimate, right? But more direct connection with the body. So I'm not working so much with the energy of the body. I don't disagree with that approach, but this is not my impression of how you do shiatsu. Shiatsu is pressure, it's pressing, it's on the body. So that if we can get this direct sensation you are getting a sense of the physical body's manifestation of the energy flow. Remember, energy is going from the channel throughout, right? So wherever the channel is flowing, the mm -hmm. physical body condition will be a reflection of the energy flow through that area. So the words that um, uh, I think are good to remember, you want yang more, you want to talk about yin and yang, and you want to talk about full and empty. So a kyo or deficient condition has an empty quality. And the way that you can find kyo is by sensing either a lack of resistance to your pressure or a flat sensation. A flat sensation, lack of resistance, lack of resilience, looseness that's those are the kinds of words that you would be keep con considering 
if you got a sense, oh, this is more kyo. Jitsu, Jitsu represents fullness. Actually, I'm, putting, I'm going a little too quickly. Let's go with Jitsu and Kyo first, okay? Jitsu, the energy is rising, so you get this full sensation. Usually in a Jitsu condition, more often than Kyo, there's pain when you press on it. Jitsu represents where the person's mind is focused. Kyo is, represents the area of the mind and things that deal with that, but the person's not addressing. So, Firstly, with Jitsu, you experience a full sensation. With Kyo, you're going to experience either flat or sinking. So those are the words for Kyo and Jitsu. But then you want to know, is a condition uh, a Yang condition or a Yin condition? You can have a Yang Jitsu or a Yin Jitsu. So my way of explaining Yang, Yang is guy, uh, is dense energy, it's energy, things coming together. So you don't only want the sensation of fullness, you want a sensation of hardness or density. And that's giving you, that's telling you that that particular a channel of energy has a yang jitsu condition. Yang jitsu in food is usually caused by three basic goods, three basic categories, excessive animal protein, Unbalanced animal protein, that's one, right? And, and like unbalanced animal protein in terms of comparison with vegetable quality. Number two, excessive baked foods. So chips, crackers, pretzels, cake, muffins, cookies, bagels. And number three, salty food because salt makes the body tight. So that's how you check for jitsu, yang jitsu. Yin jitsu, you're going to have this full sensation, but there's going to be a softness to it. So that's more like excessive, uh, excessive sugar consumption or alcohol, for example, will, this, will make, give this rising quality, but a soft quality as well. Kyo is different. So the first thing you look for is, or you sense is flat or sinking. Sinking means there's a lack of resistance to the pressure. And then you can have um, either a yang, a yang kyo or a yin kyo. I, an example that I often think of for uh, um, yin kyo, uh, 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 any, anybody in the group here from uh, Germany or Eastern Europe? Anyone? Okay. When uh, did anybody see the movie? Uh, uh, the lives, the lives of others. Okay, so if you remember the expression, um, when he was, uh, uh, he tried to crack a joke uh, in the in the canteen, and they frowned upon it. And his expression was very flat, right? But there was a hardness or a firmness as well to the person. The firmness is yang. The flat quality is kyo. So. Like East, East, uh, East Berlin, I you know, went there years ago. When you go there, it's yang. It's definitely, there's a, a hardness or a harshness, but it's all the one color. It's kind of monotonous, right? It has more of a yang quality. When you switch and you go to West Berlin, you have the hardness, but you have more color, more variety, right? So that's one way of saying that something is yin deficient. But, um, sorry, yang deficient. Yang deficient is when there's lack of energy there, lack of any sort of response uh, to your pressure. It lets you in, just body's opening. And the person probably is going to feel tired in some way. Does that help? Okay. Sarah, are you okay? Sure, it did. <laughs> there is so much explanation. Thank you. There's yeah. another question from Emily. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. I noticed that your mother hand keeps moving as well, and that sometimes it is only your thumb. Is it is that a technique from Masanaga or your own? 
What, when you say my, my mother hand is moving, I mean, um, there's always a supporting hand on the body. It's always, I don't quite understand where you say, um, could you please give me more, um, more explanation? I'll just unmute myself so that I can explain myself yes. better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I meant that when I was being taught Shiatsu and even still, um, generally my mother hand stays on one point being, I don't know, usually on the, uh, on the hara on the back somewhere and the other hand moves down or up as much as possible. Yeah, and only I, when I, you can't reach, but it seems that uh, you're moving both of them the same down the body. So I, I, I think I mentioned that when I moved the hand, didn't mm -hmm. I? Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I think this other approach of extending is doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I think theoretically it's a very nice idea, but I don't think it's very, uh, um, I don't think it works very well. What I do think works, and the other thing is, the whole concept of having a supporting hand over the deficient area. Uh, I can see, I understand the sense of that as being comforting to the person and therefore mm -hmm. allowing energy to come to that area. Uh, mm -hmm. So in some instances, yes, definitely that's great if you, can, if you can work that with a moving hand. For example, if you're working on the back between two points. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. But what I've found from, uh, from practice is that identify the excess, identify the deficiency, and work each, each uh, channel according to the techniques that you know work for excess or work for deficiency. And begin by working on the excess channel. Now that's not Masanaga's way, but we're going to get to that in a moment. I'll talk about that. Uh, my approach also is very practical. You know, if you tell somebody that something, um, or if you, for example, if you follow the logic of Masanaga's approach through, and uh, you try to encourage somebody to uh, take up this soft drink when you know they have a problem with alcohol, it's not really likely it's going to work. You know? Firstly, you have to address the problem. The problem has, this person has, you have a drinking problem, right? And you address the person in a way that demonstrates support to that person. So the way that you would use that from Shmurashiatsu's point of view is always both hands are on the body. I'm with you. This is my whole feeling about you. And then you convey that situation and then you explain what the alternative is. So for example, when I was uh, working on Pauline's neck, clearly this line, this is uh, her gallbladder air energy is excess, is jitsu. So I worked it in a way that wasn't forcing it, but I was making the body aware there's a problem. And all through the body, I would be doing the same thing with the gallbladder channel. But also I would be looking for and working the deficient or Kyo channel in a way that I think is the most appropriate way of working with the Kyo channel. And then when you come back, 95%, something like that, very high percentage, you'll see that the excess in the gallbladder channel has diminished substantially. So that way works too. You know? um, Mm -hmm. So that's the way that I do most. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Hello, Amy. Veronique uh, has a question. Okay. Uh, can you uh, talk about Hosha technique that you've learned from Masanaga? Kosha? Hosha. Uh, Hosha. Hosha. I, I don't remember the Japanese terms, I'm sorry. Tonification, sedation technique. Well, I was trying to explain just now. That's why. That's how I work. I mean, for um, tonification, if you saw when I was working on the legs here, I use uh, on the other side. I'm using fingertips a lot. Always the pressure supported, but I want to get right in there on that on that deficient channel, on that Kyo channel, and I hold. 
And while I'm holding there, it's a feeling how long it should be there. I can't say, it's not like two seconds or three seconds or whatever. You have to work it out what feels right. Mm -hmm. So that is how I'm working Kyo. Jitsu, always it must be supported and it's quick and um, it's there for the purpose of waking up the, the condition, waking up or making the body aware that there's a problem, but it's not being forceful. It's not, I'm not imposing my values on that person's body, if you know what I mean. I'm making them aware that I'm not forcing it. So or, the first step, as I explained, like having both hands on the body. Mm -hmm. If you support the body well, within that context, you can press firmly and wake the body up. So if you want to do it in a, just you, I like to look at everything in terms of communication as well. How would you communicate to that person what their condition is, okay? Through verbally, then try to think about it in terms of hands. For example, whole palm pressure, palm pressure, heel of palm pressure, uh, sorry, whole palm pressure. Right? Heel of palm pressure. Closed hands with palm. This is, each one is a little bit firmer. This is sharper. How do you want to convey the message? What do you think is appropriate on that line? That's how I would work. That's how I do work. But my treatments always, always I'm trying to identify Kyoen Jitsu from working on the abdomen, the hara to begin with, to the end of the treatment. Mm -hmm. And in the way that I work with macrobiotics, if I think I can make some comments, some constructive comments about their diet as being a cause of the problem, then I will talk about that. Pauline asked about, can you have different conditions on the same channel on different legs? Absolutely. Generally speaking, when the right side of the body, anywhere on the right side, tends to be tighter than the left side. Generally speaking, right? not always, generally, the person's diet tends to be more on the yang side. Yang affects the right side of the body. So too, as I said, too much salt, too much baked goods, too much animal protein, or in an unbalanced way, taking it in an unbalanced way. Okay. Is there anything that you could say more about the uh, Hara experience uh, from uh, Masanaga teachings? Um, the way that they did it, I, I, for me, I, I do a little differently. I didn't, because we had, the class was more on using a cloth rather than that. You know, we had to sort of lay, leave it for another time. But I begin a, a, a treatment with a para diagnosis, and then I check my treatment, uh, my diagnosis with working a little bit on the channels that are related to the diagnosis, and maybe working in the arms or in the legs, but just to see if that confirms, that's there to confirm what I was feeling in the abdomen. Um, some things are very clear and obvious, for example, heart issues, heart governor, gallbladder, liver, large intestine, uh, the only one that I had trouble with, as far as uh, uh, horror diagnosis, is stomach. I don't find that terribly helpful. I don't really get the sense with that. All the others, I, I work that. Um, I work just traditionally the way that he works. Again, always supporting the pressure. Wherever you are working on the abdomen, um, or the hara, uh, always support that pressure. Thank you. There's another question from Natasha. Uh, if you could talk about the arms, I'm not sure what Natasha meant. Okay, give me a little bit more um, of guidance of what you want me to ask you. Natasha, can you unmute yourself, please?
Natasha? Oh, she has some technical problem. I see from her face. So uh, her question is, uh, how do you work on arms? All right, well, we're, we're going to, we're getting a little out of the um, range of the, of the uh, subject, I think. Um, but I work the arms mostly on the side position. So when the person's lying on their side, I find that you have the best access there. Uh, so uh, if, can you lie down please with your head this way? You can work large intestine from here. Okay. Lungs from this way. From here. Spleen, I like to work from here. Again, when you're working here, whole body pressure, whole body. I also work the uh, kidney and bladder lines, even on the bone, this way. Heart. I work with thumbs, supporting this way. You can use the same technique for heart governor. You can use the stretches, plus another four. So if you're in this position, Always come to the pictures. Okay. From here. Heart. Heart government. Let's go. Okay. Um, so that's the main area that I would clean on. Can you lie on your stomach? Uh, both arms down on the sides. I'll also work the arms this way, from here. So when you have from here, always using the clock. It's basically the same technique. This is hard governor. And heart. So. Here, you can work. So, come through here to like you testing this. This is uncomfortable for me, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. David, can you go back to the slide? I'm um, just going to come back. Oh, I can't hear you. What did you say? Can you go back to the slide? You had a very nice information. The slide? Yes. Okay. Okay, Gail, can you show them the slides? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Right so, All right, this is David Sinsner's books. Right. Okay. Yes, you can see on the back. If you can see on the back, um, you can see all the stuff there, right? Yes. Plus, these were his diagrams up here yes. on the wall. All right. Go yes. ahead. Next, next. Now, these are from my book. And this first one is to show the difference between vertical axis and horizontal axis. The vertical axis thinking tends to focus more on the present moment. Horizontal axis is more thinking in terms of past and future. And the, the vertical axis, as I explained to you, tends to be the axis that traditionally Japanese culture uh, was on. And that the result of that is that Chinese and Japanese people tend to write down the page. They address the letter the way I explained. And it also suggests that the people have more of an inward nature. And the interesting, interesting part about this is that in our lives, we, uh, we're faced with dualisms. America is a country that loves the dualism. In other words, everything is a war. There, there's a war on cancer. There's a war on this. There's a war on that. There are two different sections. Right? To me, that's horizontal axis thinking where there's a clear distinction on the outside of the individual versus others. But there's also a dualism in vertical axis culture. And if the horizontal axis culture, if I told you it's about equality and inequality, right? Like equality and inequality, what do you think the vertical axis is about? Upper and lower, if we take that to, hierarchy. okay, hierarchy, and this is true too, but it's about superior and inferior, yeah. okay? And what it is like, with you have this vertical spiral of energy, the energy is coming in towards the center. So the person tends to be more mm -hmm. open to an inward quality in their nature, and the lower and upper is about their own being. In other words, when they're doing something, which is the right way to do it? And the right way to do it is the higher way, right? So for example, in Japanese culture, if people have committed a crime, you don't, they don't try to avoid punishment. Usually it doesn't take very long before they find the person who did something and you know, they own up to it and then they deal with it. So that's vertical and horizontal. Figure nine, if we go to it, next one, figure nine. This is showing, as I explained in the class, the difference between uh, shiatsu pressure, which is connecting with key energy and Western massage, which is just dealing with the physical body. Okay, continue. Now these channels, these, these uh, meridian charts are by Suzuki Sensei. And Suzuki was the primary teacher after Masanaga moved on, passed on. And when you look at them, they are so much more complex than Masanaga's uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to introduce this to show you that Shiatsu was, uh, Zen Shiatsu was evolved, Masanaga Shiatsu was evolving, it wasn't something static. Mm -hmm. Another example was there was a technique called Sotai uh, that became popular while I was in Japan. Sotai. And um, the book had been released while I was there, it was an expensive book. It was a hundred dollar book. And I remember there were three copies in the, in the Masanaga's uh, center. They were all experimenting with these techniques and looking at how to integrate them into their approach of Zen Shiatsu. So within that context, I feel that it's justified for me to use 
this cloth on the body. The other thing is that what I've done by using the cloth is not introducing a Western approach. It's very much in keeping with Japanese values, I think, which are very much about cleanliness and, and purification, if you look at Shinto. So it's, it's sort of a, a, an approach that's quite in harmony with the spirit of Zen Shiatsu. Okay. Uh, next yes. Oh, this. Next. Okay, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, this is the hand meridian. Meridians on the hands. Yes. Yeah, so I just bring. I brought. I introduced those two uh, pages to just show people that. Zen Shiatsu practitioners in Japan were exploring it. It wasn't static. It wasn't that they were ignoring Masanaga's approach, but they were working on it and developing it. So this is by Suzuki Sensei, who was Masanaga's, um, one of his leading uh, members of staff and teacher. He was also teaching at that time. He was also, uh, and someone who was using this approach of uh, giving some shiatsu to the jitsu line before working on kyo. Mm -hmm. Now, Corin, I gave this name because I purchased these cloths from Corin. And as you can see, they're cheap. They're only $3 each. So it's not like you're going to have to invest a lot of money to, to try this out. And they're down in, um, down near uh, Brooklyn Bridge City Hall Station here in New York. Um, okay, a key review is my website. I haven't uh, put anything on there for a long time, but I am going to again. And that's the material that I'm working on. All the material from that, website is going into books that support the teaching and study that I've done with Zen Shiatsu. My email address is that, davidsergal at optimum.net. I'm on Facebook. If you want to know what I'm doing in terms of my book, in terms of my writing, uh, please friend me on Facebook and then I will let people know when something new is coming up. And how can we find you on Facebook? Uh, just my name. Okay. Just put Thank my name you. in, and uh, there are two David Circles. I'm the old one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I put everything in the chat. Okay. All the links and email and books. Okay. I found that some of the books are available to find on internet in the stores. Right. And if you have a choice and you want to buy the book, Two things. Number one, the second printing, Natural Way Zen Shiatsu, is better than the first. It will hold together better. And secondly, please read the first chapter. I loved writing that chapter. I derived great enjoyment from that chapter, especially. Wonderful. Great. Thank okay, you. Okay, so any other questions? From, thank you. Okay. And I have a question. Can you tell us a little about your website? It is so beautiful and so interesting to read. And uh, can you please oh, tell you. us? I appreciate that. I appreciate it very much. Um, there are a couple of things about the website. Firstly, the book that I wrote, what I'm working on now, I began way back then. That's more than 30 years ago now. But when you're studying, uh, classical Chinese medicine, they make statements, for example, the eyes correspond with the liver, right? Mm -hmm. now, why did the eyes correspond with the liver, right? What's the connection? The other point is that, as I explained about the way that we address, the individual is part of a larger group. That larger group is part of a larger, 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 right? so that the individual relate, understands his or her position within the context of something bigger. 
And that vigor is the natural world. When we talk about something, a unifying force for the world, ideally the unifying force, the monarch for us, I believe, is understanding the natural world. That goes beyond politics or, uh, politics or religion. So if we look at, say, the liver corresponds with, uh, in Chinese medicine, they say wood, right? But even wood is a dead image. Dead, they say, what can you do with wood? There's just one, that's a piece of wood. But in macrobiotics, uh, Michio Kushi taught the five, what's called the five elements mm -hmm. as a transformation of energy. It changes, right? And he made one little change in uh, the wording. He changed wood to tree. Mm -hmm. And the actual Chinese character, which Kumiko can write for you, mm -hmm. for wood, is the same as tree. It can be translated either way. So by, by changing the word to tree, he was, not, um, he was not changing the philosophy. But what he was showing was in a tree that you have something rising up and you have something that is growing towards a light source. Then once you know that the tree is growing towards a light source, aha, a tree responds to light. And the eyes respond to light. So there's a connection where they've discovered through their appreciation of the natural world, something about their own body condition. Another one with tree is the nails, right? The nails correspond with the liver. Mm -hmm. Why do the nails correspond with the liver? Well, if you look at this as our trunk and this is our limb, right? And if you know, as we know, the trees grow at the periphery, then the nails must be related with tree energy and therefore with the liver. Okay? The other thing is why does the liver correspond with tree, right? So on a most fundamental level, we can see that you have water and a tree floats on water and a tree burns. So a tree is in between those two there. And uh, a tree becomes fuel for the fire. All right, so that's the first part of what I was interested in. So what I've done is I've broken down each of these five energies into their parts. You know, for example, um, fire is created by friction. Uh, fire attaches to its fuel source and doesn't let go. Mm. Observations that you can do. Water is always, um, uh, water, what can you say? Uh, is contained by the, uh, I've written this hundreds of times and I can't remember on the spot. Um, water is contained or limited within by what is contained. It's limited by its container. So firstly, you break that down. Then there's a style of, of astrology called nine star key, right? Nine star key and in this approach each of us carries that particular energy a particular energy mm -hmm. we were either born in a tree year or a metal year a soil year or a water year right so what i've done is i've gone to famous profiles of famous people they could be anybody, but usually they're famous because people write profiles about famous people. They don't write them about unfamous. Sometimes they write them about infamous people, right? So you go to the profile and you have these images of fire or, you know, as I've said, like a fire is created by friction. A fire is golden in color. Now, let me ask you a question. If you light, if you light a match, this is a match, and you light this match and you turn it up this way, what color is this here? Hmm? Well, blue is at the top, but what about the actual color of the flame? I'll tell you who it reminds me of. It reminds me of Donald Trump's hair. <laughs> he was born in a fire year, right? So he is 
uh, changing the color of his hair to this, he's really exaggerating his fire nature. And the other thing that is, we can use him as an example, we can use the politician Sarah Palin as an example, but you can see this in many, many examples. I was just reading over the weekend, a profile of uh, Marianne Faithful. It's in the New York Times uh, this weekend. A fire appeared suddenly out of nothing, right? You can <laughs> rub two sticks together and then boom, suddenly a fire appears, right? So a fire, fire appears suddenly out of nothing. So the issue of surprise corresponds with fire. So what we find in profiles of famous people, of, of anybody, but what we see and what I've seen in the famous profiles, surprise comes into the profile on some level or other. Okay? So in the case of Trump, he even surprised himself by becoming president. He wasn't planning on that. He was planning on apparently on just getting great publicity and then suddenly he's president, right? Same with Sarah Palin, you know, she was famous in Alaska, but then nowhere else. And then overnight, bang, the whole world knows about Sarah Palin. So that's an expression of fire energy. So what I've done is I've gone through literally over a thousand, maybe 1500 profiles. There's been a lot of work breaking them down into sections and then into according to their energy and then seeing how they manifest that. And then we get a better picture of us. And uh, when we're doing a shiatsu and we talk about their soil energy problem or their spleen or their stomach, we can then talk about life experiences that might create that problem. We can talk about food as well, but this is also about life experience. And then it becomes really interesting. It's like for me, when I'm, when I'm writing or reading these, so, wow, that sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Exactly. A lot of enjoyment in actually doing the research because it's all new. Um, and uh, for example, um, Philippe Petit, who walked in the clouds, right? He walked uh, between the Twin Towers, right? He was born in a six medal year, which corresponds with heaven, right? And uh, there are actually three names, there are three numbers in the system. There's a three, there's, in his case, the numbers are six, eight, and three. So he was born in a heaven year, which is six, but eight corresponds with the mountain and the mountain corresponds with stillness, right? So when you think about him up there with that, this bar, right? To, to be able to one, walk, on that narrow road, eight times he crossed between them, right? Uh, he had to be, had, have such an acute sense of stillness. That was the eight quality in his nature. And the three quality corresponds with thunder and shock. And that's how we, as people viewing him, respond to what he did, which is pretty true, I think, right? Oh my goodness, what's this guy doing up there? Right? So that, has a, there's a lot of, uh, it, it's a, a great learning experience to actually be writing. Um, it's just a long process, but you can get some idea as um, if you read those, the, the few that I have put up there. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Um, I have many more questions about your website and about your articles, and I really um, encourage everyone here to visit uh, David's uh, website and read more into his your studies. <laughs> uh, so, but today we are out of time, so I hope you will visit us again and there are no words to express our gratitude for you joining us today. It's a very big day for us and for Shiatsu community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm uh, delighted to have done this and I really thank you, Kumiko, for the invitation and Yoshi again for referring me. And thank you, been, David. It's been great. Well, thank really you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. Please come right. back and talk okay. about more.
Nine stars. Bye. Nine star key. Okay, we can do a whole class on nine star key. <laughs> yes, we all of us are stars. We wanna I wanna make sure everybody shines. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you everyone for coming today, Bye. joining today. Let's continue to learn and study and share. Please continue to teach. Please continue to give us sessions to help many. Just the energy must be transformed, transferred to others. It's one person at a time, but hope we can unite again and expand our healing energy. Thank you again, and let's meet again and uh, continue. So next month, we have uh, fantastic presenters. We are inviting such a great presenters, speakers. We are so honored to have this platform, honored to have uh, great presenters coming to our way. So see you soon. Yes, Wendy Bonamese, she's gonna be teaching level one. This is a Zoom platform. Everybody can join from anywhere, everywhere. Please contact us for more information. Let's put the both hands together and Gasha. And we are so grateful to have David and grateful to have this moment is ours together. Have a peace and enjoy. Yes. And let's send the healing energy to kids. So everybody, be safe. Be happy. <laughs> Perfect. See you soon. Bye. Oh, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye. Ciao, bye bye. 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 Thank bye, you, David. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. So just leave. Yeah. And it's took it to the now. Bye. 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 Bye.